Just like humility, when we think we are humble, that's your arrogant right there. If you say you have wisdom, very possibly you do not have wisdom because as we talked about false wisdom last time, we would like to focus on what is true wisdom. There is a contrast between earthly and heavenly wisdom. Wisdom does not mean knowledge or information as we talked about it last week. It does not mean information or knowledge. So just because one has knowledge and understanding does not necessarily make that person a wise person. Wisdom is application of knowledge into righteous behavior. So if your knowledge and if your information does not translate into your righteous behavior in terms of your living, then you cannot claim yourself to having a wisdom from above. Wisdom is not what you know. It is how you live because it is the parameter on your spiritual condition. Just like all the other tests that James has given to us, how you respond to trials and temptation to the word of God, to the needy, how you speak with your mouth, what comes out of your heart, all these are tests, and he is giving us another test of wisdom. If you claim yourself to possessing wisdom, show it, prove it, because true wisdom is knowing God in a life-changing relationship. If your life has not changed, if you're not living a life of changed life, then you cannot claim yourself to be a possessor of true wisdom. Last week we looked at wisdom from the Old Testament briefly because that's the basis of what James is writing. His audience was Jewish. They understood the writings of the Old Testament, but we do not have that understanding. Old Testament was basically initiated by the fear of the Lord. All the passages we looked at, especially the book of Ecclesiastes, all this vanity, it comes right down to where God's servant Job and others said, it is the fear of God which is the beginning of wisdom. It is truly a mark of a believer to show the wisdom of God, but none of us have it to the fullest capacity. That is why we need to study this topic of wisdom. Fearing the Lord is turning from iniquity, which is the essence of saving faith. If you want to know what is the essence of saving faith, it is turning away from your iniquity at the same time, simultaneously, it is fearing the Lord. Not so that you will be judged by God, that kind of fear, but it is the fear, respect, and awe, and reverence. Do you have that fear, awe, and respect for God today? Or do you think that God is so gracious that he's not going to do anything to you so you live any way you want, speak any way you want, go any way you want, look at anything you want? The New Testament also ties wisdom to the act of believing. If you turn to the book of Matthew chapter 7, let us read from verse 24 there. You look on the screen as I read out loud. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat it on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Amen. Here you have a very religious person who has no foundation. The Bible calls him a fool. You can be very religious today but your foundation is on a shaky ground, you are a foolish person, but the one who does the word of God is a wise person. Wisdom is equated with saving faith. Those who are saved must and will possess wisdom. So conversely, if you are not a child of God, you do not have wisdom. If you do not have wisdom, you are not a child of God. Again, not everybody has 
the totality of God's true wisdom. We have a long way to go. But you are on your way. You are a wise person pursuing the things of God. You are a fearer of God. You are on your way. That proves that you are a child of God. But if you're going the other way, you have no fear of God. There is no fear of God in your eyes at all. Truly, we can say that you are not a child of God. Who among us can judge? But the Bible clearly says that you are able to tell by what one produces. If what comes out of your mouth, if what comes out of your life is nothing but evil and malice, slander, and you go around saying, I am full of wisdom, I am a child of God, sorry, no you're not. Only God knows who's truly saved, yes. We cannot throw the first stone, yes. But we can tell by the fruits that we're producing. In Matthew 25, starting with verse 1, we read this. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps. These lamps represent Christian profession or symbols. And went to meet the bridegroom, five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil and our lamps are going out. But the wise answer, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go after to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour. Brothers and sisters, the foolish virgins had all the symbols on the outside, but nothing on the inside. You can look religious today. You can carry a 50-pound King James Version Bible. You can quote Bible passages. You can dress like a Christian, sing like a Christian, talk like a Christian, smell like a Christian if they were possible. Thank you for that giggle. We don't ever get that here at Cross Point. It's a miracle. <laughs> I was told to stay with my strong points. It has been suggested to me, stay away, stay away from the jokes. That's not your strong point. My Korean counterpart pastors, who I see eight to ten hours a day, every day except Monday, and even on Monday sometimes, they have all these jokes that they tell each other, and I'm just sitting there bombarded with all kinds of Korean jokes. And I, so I try a few times, and they fail each time. But, so I went back, and I reported to them, hey, I thought that joke would work. You told me to use it, and I used it. It failed. It bombed. So then they told me another one, make sure you try this one. I'm not going to try it here. <laughs> <laughs> you can look religious on the outside, but on the inside, do you possess what's necessary to be a saved person? Oil cannot be transferred because salvation cannot be transported from one to another. Just because your parents are saved does not mean that you will be saved. In terms of wealth, perhaps if your parents are rich, they will give to you as an inheritance their wealth. But when it comes to faith, it does not transfer down. No matter whether your best friend is a Christian, whether your favorite person in the world is a Christian and you look up to that person, does not mean that you would be a Christian. It cannot be transferred. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 22 and 24, we read, For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, 
Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, and in verse 30 of that same chapter, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. Christ became to us wisdom from God. We who possess Christ, in other words, we are people of wisdom. The world might say we're foolish, but in the end, we know that God will make sure that every eye will see, every knee will bow and confess before Christ as Lord, that the rest of the world who will not bow and confess Jesus to be Lord are the ones who are foolish. And it is speaking of Christ. Colossians chapter 2 verse 3 simply says, In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In whom, that is Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So if you know Christ, you have unsearchable wisdom at your disposal. You have wisdom. That is precisely what James is proposing here. He compares verses 14 to 16, which is false wisdom, with verses 17 and 18, true wisdom, which we will now look at. But first, false wisdom, I'll be talking about in your outlines there, the motivation, the characteristics, and the results. First, the motivation of false wisdom, verse 14, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, in your hearts, do not boast and be false in the truth. The place of motivation is your heart. In your heart, it says. In Proverbs chapter 4, in the New Living Translation, verse 23, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows, flows from it. Everything that you do flows out of your heart. That is the place of your motivation. There are two things that motivate it's bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Where does false wisdom come from? Where does it originate? It comes from two areas, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. What are the motives behind human wisdom? Again, number one, bitter jealousy. Bitter jealousy, which is harsh or bitter, used of bitter, undrinkable water. Have you ever drank water that was undrinkable, and yet you're so thirsty you ended up drinking it? is bitter, that word is harsh. An evil jealousy is a harsh, bitter self-centeredness that produces a resentful attitude toward others. So on the one hand, it is jealousy. The other one is selfish ambition, which is personal, that creates rivalry or an attitude of antagonism. A bitter jealousy or jealous attitude toward anybody who threatens your accomplishments or your reputation. So anytime somebody looks better than you, does something better than you, sings better than you, preaches better than you, uh, hard to find, but you have all these, <laughs> you have all these people who are better than you making you look bad. When you stand next to that person, you are belittled and you look like a little shorter, maybe a little heavier, whatever the case. So you hang around with people that are not threatening and you are jealous, you have evil jealousy and selfish ambition. Selfish ambition is getting the goal at any cost. It is personal gratification at any cost. The wisdom that is not of God is selfish, self-centered, consumed with ego fulfillment. Do you know anyone like that? Always talking about him or herself. Every topic has to be about you. No matter where the topic is, it comes back right to you. I remember when I was in college, I believe, or high school, one of those two. I have a younger brother who's three years younger than I am. And relax, it's not a joke. He came into my room one day and poured out his heart. Brother, I have this, this need. So I listened to him for a while, and then I started giving him advice, as men like to do. We like to solve problems. Women, on the other hand, I'm told, just want to be heard. But here I was telling, giving solutions, and at the end of my great advice, I thought, he says, how come every time I come talk to you, I end up listening to you? <laughs> We're like that. Selfish ambition. The wisdom that is not of God is selfish, self-centered, consumed with ego fulfillment. 
It is proud, it is being selfish, it is self-centered, working for our personal gain. And this motivation comes from the false wisdom. It comes from our selfishness. In verse 14 of James 3, do not boast and be false to the truth. In other words, stop arrogantly boasting. Stop boasting that you have wisdom when in fact you do not. Stop giving your opinion as though that's the absolute gospel truth when in fact it is totally erroneous. It is a foolish statement to be made. Are you motivated by what honors God, by humility? Or are you on a massive ego trip to fulfill your own desires? Many of you are educated. Many of you are well versed in the cultures. You are well informed in all areas of life. But are you motivated by what honors God, by humility, or are you doing so to fulfill your selfish desires? There is no single characteristic of unredeemed that is unsaved more obvious than being totally dominated by pride and self. There is no characteristic more obvious than that. So if you want to tell the difference between a child of God and a non-child of God, one characteristic that sets apart between the two is this selfish pride and ego. Have you ever seen a Christian that was well knowledge in the things of God and yet see someone who's very down to earth and humble? There is a person who truly possesses true wisdom. That's the motivation. Secondly, the characteristic of false wisdom in verse 15, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic it does not come down from above. It is not from God. James 1.17 says this, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. True wisdom comes from above. False wisdom comes from the world. So James gives us three words to describe the wisdom that is false. There are three enemies to a believer. Mark this in your hearts. Three enemies to a believer. First is earthly. That is the world. It is limited to time and space. It cannot crawl out of its prison. It is doing your own thing. You are so trapped in your own mind, in your own world, in this evilness. You cannot get out. You cannot crawl out. It is limited to corruption of their own system. It pervades philosophy, education, every dimension of life. You're trapped because of your thinking, your evil earthliness. Second enemy is unspiritual. It is animal, natural, sensuous, whatever in the natural world that is unspiritual. We are told in 1 Corinthians 2 in the New Living Translation, verse 14, but people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it, for only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. Only those who are born of the Spirit can understand the things of the Spirit. So if you are trying to evangelize to someone, if you're trying to make clear or sense to someone about the gospel, and if they are not born of the Spirit, that is, the Holy Spirit has not taken up residence in that person yet, then that person will never understand what you're talking about. So do not wonder, do not worry, how come, God, that this person I've been trying to witness is not really breaking through? Why? Why? That's because that person is not capable of understanding the things of God. And the third enemy is demonic. It's being demon-like. Everything out of the mind is really generated by demons or evil system. So we have earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Even Eve in the Garden of Eden was told a lie. Satan came to Eve and said, eat that fruit that was forbidden and you will have knowledge like God. That was a lie. 
Satan always lies, promises wisdom to us. Do not give in to the false lies given from Satan. It leads people into arrogance, immorality, self-contentment, and self-sufficiency. We don't want to do that. We want to get away from that. The only thing that restrains the world from an absolutely animalistic existence is the restrainer, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the restrainer. Without the Holy Spirit controlling and containing and restraining what's going on, this world will be in much worse situation. But do you realize that the world is getting worse? Do you even worry that it's getting worse and worse? Every time you look, it's getting worse. The only thing that restrains the world from an absolutely animalistic existence is the restrainer, the Holy Spirit. When you look at the world, do you see it getting worse and worse? Or do you see it getting better? And do you hope that it's getting better and better? Are you hoping for a utopia? Are you waiting for this world to be perfect for you? It cannot go any other way due to all who are locked up with human wisdom. They do not have any answers. Education does not have answers. Philosophy does not have answers. Only the wisdom that can come from God and from above are we able to then solve anything, but the world is getting worse. Do not be alarmed. The world has to get worse before the Prince of Peace will come and rectify, put an end to, and recreate, getting rid of the old and recreating the entire universe. The motivation, the characteristics, and the results of false wisdom is found in verse 16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. The word disorder is coming out of chaos or confusion or instability. So for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be chaos, confusion, and instability in every vile practice. And it's the same word used in the first chapter in the New International Version, verse 8. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. We covered that earlier in chapter 1, that a person has a double-minded, double mind, and unstable. He's unstable in all he does. So earthly wisdom will always destroy fellowship, intimacy, love. It'll bring chaos and discord. So whenever you see a fellowship breaking down, whenever you see a brother or sister in discord, whenever you see some disharmony happening in the church, that's the work of Satan. And those who are claiming to have wisdom, true wisdom from above, in actuality are working for Satan. They do not possess true wisdom from God. They possess the false wisdom coming from Satan, the world. Are you seeing it happen all around our world? Discord, anger, bitterness, inability to get along with people, world going to get worse. So James asks in verse 13, who is wise? Who is wise? Every Sunday or every week we have to put our sermon title to the chat room where pastors can know which title and verse we are going to be giving, and my title that I gave was, Who is Wise? Who is Wise? And one of the pastor's name is Wise. He looked at that, he jumped up, and he came to me. That's me! What do you mean, who is wise? I am wise! I am wise! And I told him, hey, why don't you come here and let me use you as a, an object, you know, like, and then he goes, no, I can't do that. Why not? You're wise. Let me use you. I've been talking over it for two weeks, and I'm trying to convince him, but he says, no, i got to go and do some stuff up there. I go, okay, I'll just try doing it without you. James asks, who is wise? Let's find out. True wisdom. In your outline, the second major point there, true wisdom. Again, we'll be talking about motivation, characteristics, and results of true wisdom. First, 
The motivation is found in verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, and good fruits, impartial and sincere. What is the motivation? It is being pure. The word pure means moral sincerity, spiritual character, spiritual integrity, free from selfish ambition and self-promotion. So what is the motivation of having true wisdom is being pure. First motivation is the wisdom of God. The first wisdom, the wisdom of God is pure. That's your motive. You show me a believer and I will show you whose heart has pure desires to do God's will, to serve and to love. If one does not have the desire to do God's will and to serve him and to love him, he does not possess wisdom, therefore is not a believer. There is a condition of a true believer as indicated in Matthew 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure means, pure, the word pure started out meaning a ceremonial cleansing where you washed your body. When you washed your body, you were clean or pure. Eventually, though, it came to refer to a moral purity, which allowed you to approach your God with a small g. You are able to approach your God or gods. And that word was used. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, makes it clear, holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Holiness is absolutely important. What is our motivation for possessing wisdom of God? Is purity. The prophet Ezekiel says, salvation is when God takes away your stony heart and gives you a new heart. Every believer is given a new heart. He removes this stony heart and replaces it with a new heart, brand new heart. But the question is, if we possess this new heart, our stony heart was removed, how come we still sin? We are consumed with purity, but we sin because our new heart is captured in our old flesh. If you want to find out more about the flesh and how we are going to be glorified, come out on Wednesday. We're studying Wednesday, Romans chapter 8, covering some great, great truths. Characteristics of true wisdom. It says right there, first of all, is peaceable. It means peace-loving, peace-promoting. Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Secondly, gentle. And this word is the most difficult to translate by scholars. And so they came up with a composite of different words to describe this. And let me give them for you. It is sweet reasonableness. Gentleness is sweet reasonableness. It is also humble and being patient, humbly patient. One is humble and patient. It is also an attitude of consideration. You consider others. It is humility. Gentleness also is kindness without hatred, without malice, without revenge. Matthew 5, 11 says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. You're blessed when that happens. Have you ever been told lies about you? Some things were said about you that were not true. It says, be blessed. You are blessed when others do that and persecute you. If you're receiving persecution as a result of your dumbness or stupidity, something that you've done that was wrong, that is not what this is talking about. It's talking about you being persecuted for the cause of Christ, and yet you were given all this treatment, you're blessed. Third is open to reason. Characteristics, third one, open to reason. You are willing to yield. You are not stubborn. You are easily persuaded. Do you know some people who are so naive, they believe anything? Biblically, you're blessed. You're open to reason, easily persuaded, teachable. You're not ready to just shout out your opinion, but when you are told something, you are humble, you're teachable, you're compliant. 
especially when it comes to the word of God. You don't say, yeah, but, yeah, but. You say, amen, amen. It is used of a person who submits to military discipline willingly. It is that idea. Matthew 5, 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's the spirit. Next one is full of mercy. It is having a concern for people who suffer. Not just forgiving who have wronged you, but reaching out to people with compassion who are in suffering. Some of you are very good at that because perhaps you suffered. You went through so much suffering yourself that you are so sensitive to the needs of others. But it's that idea, full of mercy is showing compassion to people who are suffering. For in Matthew 5, 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. That's the evidence of saving faith, to be concerned for others, having compassion for others. It is to having a desire to give to those who are in need. Next one is good fruits, good works. It is wide variety of spiritual deeds. In one of the questions, what are some specific deeds that you are doing in your life in your small groups today? Discuss that. But having good fruits is any wide variety of spiritual deeds. And another one there is impartial, that is without partiality. It is being unwavered, unwavering, undivided in its commitment, no shifting, it is being consistent. Another characteristic there, last one on this list is sincere, without hypocrisy, it is being genuine, not phony, not fake, no pretense, no make, it is just as it is. Christians cannot make very good poker players. In order to be a good poker player, I'm told, you have to have a face that's, even though you have bad hands, you still like, act like you have very, very good cards. And you lie and you fake. and Not very good poker players. You got to be genuine, no phony, no fake, no pretense. So when a person claims true wisdom, you must show pure motives, having peace, humble, patient, non-retaliatory spirit, a sweet reasonableness, willingness to yield in obedience, a habit of merciful compassion, acts towards others, being genuine. All of these things are characteristics of true wisdom. And finally, they're the results of true wisdom. What does it produce? What does it produce? Verse 18, and the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Wisdom is equated with righteousness. It is the law of sowing and reaping. Whatever you sow, you reap. Wisdom is equated with righteousness. True wisdom will always have righteousness. So if you do not have righteousness, all you have is evilness, wickedness in you, you cannot possibly claim that you are a possessor of wisdom from above. So ask yourself, do I have the wisdom of God? What are the specific deeds that I do? What is my attitude? You are not a child of God, but you look like a child of God. You look like you have the wisdom from above because you've been hanging around with Christians. All of your friends are Christians. You send your children to Christian preschools. You come to worship, you praise and yet you really have not fully accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. Or you are in the godly wisdom area, but you have been hanging around the world so long, you look like you do not possess any heavenly wisdom. Either way, you are in that gray area. You want to be able to tell people and let people know that you are a child of God possessing this true wisdom. We, yes, have a long way to go, but we must be gentle, teachable, peaceful, meek, kind most of the time. We will lose our temper. We will have our moments, yes, but that ought to be very minimal. On the other hand, if you are wicked and vile and unrighteous most of the time, 
and yet sometimes you're kind, meek, and mild. You are not a child of God. That's what James is saying. Who is wise? Who is wise among us? Who is? Are those who are in Christ, whose Holy Spirit is the resident in your heart. Are you a possessor of the Holy Spirit? Only a child of God possesses the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not some kind of an eerie spiritual figure that's floating about in the air. Holy Spirit is equal to the second person of the Trinity, same with the first person of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. When you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit, being equal with Christ, equal with the Father, enters your heart. He enters every born-again child of God. If you do not possess the Holy Spirit this morning, simply say, Lord Jesus, I do not fully understand you, but I am told that without you there is no salvation. I have been living my life in worldly, secular ways. I've been selfish. I've been self-centered. But now I want to give up all of this, and I want to focus my life center around you. Receive me as your child. Give me salvation. Help me to go to heaven when I die. Let the Holy Spirit rule my heart. Let him take up residence. Tell me what to do how to do things, where to go, what to say. Give me the wisdom that can only come from above and receive Jesus Christ into your hearts and you too will be the possessor of heavenly wisdom, true wisdom.